Well, welcome to the Totally Awesome Fishing Show, and we're on a voyage of discovery yet again. We come all the way to Essex, believe it or not. Long drive for us, us Hampshire people, but we're here at Crow's Heath Fishery, and we're here to look at a commercial day ticket pike fishery. We're right next to me, well, right behind me, in fact, is Hanningfield Trout Reservoir, which is very famous. So I want to get in there, I want to meet the fishery manager and see what he's got to say, because I don't think I've ever fished a commercial pike water before. Let's get on with it. Well, Nick, pleased to meet you. Pleased to meet you too. Glad to be here. The weather's, uh, weather's actually, well, it's not brilliant. It's windy, but the rain, there's no rain. That's the main thing. Yes. Now, we're here at Crow's Heath Fishery. You are the fishery manager. Indeed, I am. But you are trying something different. You have got here, as I understand it, a commercial pike water. A nice little lagoon, it is, which yes. you stock with pike, but more important, you look after them by feeding them, you know, with natural fish to keep, uh, you know, to keep them nice and fit and healthy. So now listen, as far as we're concerned at the Tony Wilson Fishing Show, pike are the new carp. That's the new species coming along for popularity. So we want to be in there first and we want the exclusive on it. And we want to catch a fish as well. Nick, tell us something about it. Uh, the pike bait was created around about two and a half years ago now. Um, it was created uh, because I, I had come on board to Crow's Heath about three years ago. And I knew that pike fishing was becoming big. Um, so I took it upon myself to, to ask the owner uh, of the land in the lakes uh, to, to create this pike lake. Um, so to test the water, to, to prove that it is as, as big as what I said it was going to be, which it is, yeah. um, we, we, we tested the water and created a pike lake, which is about half an acre in size, uh, with about 25 pike in there, ranging from about four pounds right up to 22.8 was the biggest that's come out of there so far. So it's a big fish, but that's It is water. indeed, yes, yeah. Um, there's, as I say, there's 25 in there. Uh, we only let four people at a time fish the lake, so it's always best to give us a call, just sure. in case it, it is busy down there. Now this is, some people, know, this is like, people say, well it's quite small, but this is a test water with a potential to open up say other lakes, you know, it's, it's like a test project almost really, isn't it? Exactly that, exactly. Um, rather than, because it's not my money that I'm spending um, and uh, I'm hopefully giving them the best advice uh, based on my knowledge. Yeah. Um, and they, they trust me enough to, to, to try it at least, so. Uh, yeah, now you've got other lakes here as well, because uh, when we pulled in, we saw a big lake there. What, I saw some bivvies up there, so tell us a little bit about the, uh, the carp fishery here. The carp fishery, uh, it, the, the main lake is eight and a half acres in size. Um, we, we aim to take out anything under £10 and feed them in a stock pond, so you'd be very unlucky to catch anything under £10. So your average size in there that you'll be catching is between sort of 15 to £17. Um, we've got a nice stock of 20s, we've got seven known 30s in there as well. Seven, really? Seven, yes. Uh, a few of them are named. Uh, the most famous one in there is probably the Diamondback or the Armadillo. Uh, whichever one's after. Yeah. Um, what ways are those then? They, uh, the armadillo was last out at 38 and a half and the diamondback was out last at 36 and a half. So we're looking within a year, maybe 40? I'm hoping yeah. that, I'm hoping that. With the mild winter that we're having this year, I'm hoping that we're going to see some record weights coming out of there this year. It, it sounds like I should have been bringing my carp <laughs> as well as my pike. Exactly, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. And there are any other species in there? What else there are. There, there, there's some catfish. Uh, the biggest cat that we've had come out of the main lake was at £96 three years ago. £96? £96, yes. God, oh, that's a big yes, fish. It is indeed, yes. Any unusual um, uh, sort of catfish in there? Yes, we've actually got uh, the biggest mandarin catfish in the country. Its biggest weight that's come out of it was £72. And we didn't even know it existed in there until one of our members, Jimmy, pulled it out. Now, what does that mean, mandarin? That's a new one to me. Mandarin is uh, rarer than an albino, because your albinos are, are more white, whereas your mandarin is more of an orangey colour. Um, it's got some nice orange flanks down there, some of the markings on there are, uh, are even blue to some. Is that right, really? They are, yes. So, um, really, you've got sort of two lakes for predator fishing. You know, yes. the guys could come and maybe have a day pike fishing, 
on this sort of test pipe water you've got, but they can also yeah. go for the cats. Yes. And uh, and have a, have a chance of a, a, a chunking great big catfish by the oh, sound yes. of it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, we had a guy come down recently, a guy called Tony Corbett from the Catfish Conservation Group, and he had uh, one of the UK's biggest braces ever. He caught the mandarin at 64 and a half, and then very shortly after that he had a 75. Wow. Yes. This is this is in England. It is, yeah, yeah. <laughs> no yeah. need to travel to the Ebro where we go. No, definitely yeah. not. Definitely now, not. what would they just give guys an idea? I know we're here doing pipe, but I'm still sucked in by the predators of catfish. Mm-hmm. Uh, give us a run through on baits and stuff like that. What do these catfish eat? They eat absolutely anything. Absolutely anything. The, the, the catfish were, were brought up on the on the carp lake on a carp diet, so they're, they're not afraid of a, a monster squid pop-up or even a couple of pound fish if they can fit it in their mouth. So they... They really have a, a wide, uh, varied diet. Gotcha, gotcha. Okay, there's some big fish in there. Now, getting back to that uh, pike lake, what do you have a season on it or anything like that? Or we is do. it open all year round, or no, do you sort of protect it? It's not. We we, we close it during the, the normal river close season, uh, which is uh, from October to March. It's open. Um, yeah. So. So, 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 so it's a winter fishing, you're trying to protect, no pike fishing in the summer? No, of course not, of course. They're mm-hmm. very, uh, although people think that they are an aggressive uh, fish and they're hard as, hard as nails, when the truth is that they are very, very soft and very fragile. Yes. Um, and don't really... Uh, they don't stand up well in the summer. No, 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 summer, no, no, no. Hot, hot, high water temperatures, you, you've really got to get them. If I don't fish for to be honest, unless I pick the odd fish up, you know, spinning for perch or something right. like that. But generally, I've got to be honest myself, I don't start pike fishing maybe till the end of September, October, you know, when they're coming into condition a little mm-hmm. bit. Yeah, no, totally. Now, as well as lures, and obviously dead baits on this pipe water, I understand that you allow live baiting there. Now, whoa, calm down, ladies, calm down. You can live bait, you can actually use live fish if you want. Let's face it, that's what the pike eat. You can live bait here, providing the fish are provided by that fishery. So you've actually got a system here where you can not only feed those pike that you've got in this in this um, test lagoon, but you can supply them to the angler as well. Indeed, we do. Yes, uh, as you say, it's very very controversial, um, but that's what pike eat. They they are a natural predator and they eat fish. Um, we we regularly top up the the fish in there. So the, for baits for, for them to eat naturally and for people to catch to use as live bait from the lake itself. You've got, you've got a little um, uh, stock pond or a couple of stock ponds for fish, I understand. We have, yes. Uh, we, we've got a couple of stock ponds for, for carp, for roach, uh, for bringing them on. Um, and that's how we regularly keep up with the, the stock on the lake to make sure that they don't run out so that they can keep packing on that weight and being healthy. So an angler turns up with a day ticket and he thinks, right, I've tried lures, I've tried dead bait, I'm going to have to go to live bait. What does he do? Does he, do, you know, he, he can catch them himself from one of these uh, ponds? Of course, yes. Not, not from our stock ponds because they, they have nets over them, they're protected. Um, but where, where we keep a, a good level of stock in there of, of bait fish, um, you can bring it on the float rod as well uh, and catch your live bait as you go. So you've got to go on the main main lake and catch your bait there? No, 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 on, on, on the pike lake itself. Oh, I see, I see, so you catch your bait there, yeah? Yeah, of course, yes. Now, on the uh, subject of fish transportation, obviously there's a rule stand. As I understand it, you can't transport fish, and this is due to the fact of you're going to you know, push the disease, if there is a disease, around the country all over. Exactly. So now, this is you're, you're, you're encapsulated here because you're using your own fish. How does that fall with the EA? Are they happy with that? They are, yes. As long as the fish is already stocked and in, in that lake, um, you can transport the fish from the stock ponds by rod and line without needing the Section 30 consent. Okay. Um, the, uh, the rules are in place to, to stop the spread of diseases and to stop other people bringing fish in and introducing them into the water which aren't already registered as stock in that, that water. I mean, it's, it's common sense, really. I mean, years and years ago, I'm talking 40 years ago, everybody was transporting buckets of fish all over the place. And that was what presumably caused, uh, you know, the a lot of the carp population had different diseases. I'm not sure which of the separated families, you know, were susceptible to the diseases, but there's no question that fish being transported around were carrying diseases. And of course, you've got the other factor that if fish are moved around, that disease might wipe out a totally different species. So if you're moving roach around and you think, oh, I'm going to give another population of roach disease, it might not actually be that. It might be a totally different virus you're giving to, yes. let's say, the carp or indeed even the pike. Mm-hmm. So here you've got a perfect situation, as I can see it, 
for control in it and seeing how those pike actually do grow. Do they grow in fact? Have you found anything they there? Do, yeah, um, we've just had a new new 20 pound come out that was originally stocked in there, I think just over 19. Uh, that came out at £20.08. So that's putting so, weight on? Yes, it certainly on. is, yeah, yeah. I mean, with the amount of fish that we, we keep in, in the lake for it to eat, it's, it's never ever going to go hungry in there. Now, these lakes, are they chalk-fed, spring-fed, river-fed? What's the system here? Uh, the system is, is they were man-made uh, back in 1999. Um, so we benefit from the from the land drains that were already in the land. Yes. So, so any any that falls on, so we're, we're a 110 acre site here, so we, we, we've got enough runoff from the fields in the lake to keep So it diverts into the lake? Of course, yes, yes. I mean, we're, we're constantly letting water out. Um, because we've got an abundance of it, especially at this time of year, this winter with the rain that we've had. So. Hey, listen, this winter, 2014, we've all had an abundance of rain. Yeah. We're most grateful it's not raining today. So we're going to go down these lakes. Now, I've got some sardines because my particular method is twitching baits. I like twitching dead baits. Now, I don't have a problem with live baiting whatsoever. But what do you think? Should we, should we get some live baits and, uh, and give them a go as well? Of course, yes. Okay. Yeah, definitely. Well, let's crack on down there and see if we can't at least catch one pike out of this test lake. Well, guys, I've actually bought my own bucket. And if you do come here, or indeed anywhere that allows you to move live bait around on its own fishery, get yourself a nice big bucket like this. Now, I use this for live baiting, for, mostly for sand eels, uh, small mackerel. You can use a little bubble pump, one of these. They didn't give it to me free, so I put my fingers over whose it is about 40 years old and a little stone bubbler there I dropped it in to make the bubbles but I've cut a split here you know so I can I can lodge that on there without straining the edge of the plastic but more important if I put the lid on there now it's going to pinch that airline so I cut another slot out of here the width of the battery bubbler there I can pop the lid on so when I walk along it doesn't slop everywhere and a hole in the middle where I drop the stone through you can see all the bubbles coming out there of the air, pop it down in the hole, put it out deep, and then I locate in this little notch right here, the tube goes in there, and it's easy, I can carry it around, there's one big missing link, there's no fish in here. Nick, have you got any fish for me? Well, the net's in the water. What have you got in there, Nick? Right, we've been we've been quite active. We've gone and caught you some roach ready for you. What a service! What a visit. service! Yeah. Unfortunately, I haven't got a nice little device like this, uh, yeah. so we've had to keep them in the net in the lake, so to keep them alive and, and healthy. Now, how do people? There. These are going to be roach, yeah. These are, yeah, yeah. So um, they come on the lake. How are they going to catch them live? But just run, you know, people through how you want to catch them live, the easy way. The easy way, uh, just the old match te uh, techniques and methods. Uh, little float rod, uh, little waggler. Um, a little bit of sweet corn maggot usually does does the trick for some of these smaller roach. In the margins? In the margins, uh, on on the lake over there. These ones have actually come from our stock pond that, we, that we've been growing on for you, which sure. is why they're in here. Ready, ready to go. Ready yeah, to ready to go, to go in go. there. Yeah. Okay, and, and, and you can come with maggots. There's, you know, there's no restrictions on. You can only use four maggots a day and half a pint of this. No, you, no. You, no, you, you, you no, can come loaded up with bait, and you've got a good chance of catching some. Definitely, definitely. I mean, we, as I said, we've. We've got a stock pond full of the roach and we keep it topped up in there so you will, you'll never really go without a bite. But sometimes with fishing the, the, wow. the, the roach can be more elusive than the pike are so. There's only one place they need to go, two places. Yes. The first place is in this bucket yep. and the second place is on my hook. Let's get going. It's a nice little roach here aren't they? Yep. I've got you a size. That is perfect bait size. I'm not a great lover of big big fish of any species to be honest. Because these little ones, you know, they'll catch, they'll still catch pike. I know people use a big fish, but I generally, if I do live bait, which is rare, do you know what I'd sooner I'd sooner use a small fish like that than a I can't be using a great big one pound roach. I'm sorry, I know the pike eat them, but that's a lovely fish to catch. I won't use big fish. You'll never see me with a big live bait on except when I'm marlin fishing. And then it's about 14 pounds. Right, let's get down the lake, pop that bubbler in. They'll be all nice and happy and healthy. Well, <laughs> until the pike eats them.
Now one of the key things about pike fishing is visibility. We've not had rain for a few days, which is nice, although it's raining a bit now. Water clarity is really, really clear, so we might be able to spot some pike. First thing, nice peaked cap, get a peaked cap, shut that light down, and then definitely a pair of these. Polarizing glasses, much, much easier. Shuts down all that light, all that glare and reflection, cloud reflection. On a day like today, it's really overcast. Shuts down all that reflection, and you can see fish and movement, especially when you're twitching that sprat. You may not be able to see the fish take it, but you'll see the fish cover it, and it's always a good uh, indicator of when you see a pike. Another tip with the uh, live bait, water's really cold, obviously we're middle of winter at the moment. Just get a small dip net, save your hands getting cold. That way, you don't have to get your hands as wet, not as cold, and you can get your live bait out nice and easy. Got my VB double hooks, just a single hook, there's no other hook up here, just a single VB double hook. You wanna go through just the top lip only, don't wanna go through the bottom lip as well because you actually stop them breathing. So there we go, through the top lip and that's ready to swim around. There you go, there you can see he's kicking around. Gentle underarm cast, and you should see the float. You can tell if he's alive and kicking. There you go, you can see the float wobbling around. And he's quite an active one, actually. He's going across the lake. I can actually just see a baby roach. In, oh, I can actually see him, actually. Just go across that gravelly bit, I just saw him go. See him taking that float away. Almost like a pipe tape, really. And all the way over to the other lake, other side of the lake. Basic rig here, 12 pound line, I haven't dropped below 12 pound line, but here I've got a stop knot. I've tied a stop knot in and left about a quarter of an inch either side so the float can slide right up against that and that sets my depth. The reason for that being, if I want to fish really deep, and it's not deep here, but if you're live baiting, generally you want to fish, you know, I would have thought half to three quarters of the depth of that water is just there, the float comes up against that stop knot, you see, just like this. But more important, I can move that with my thumb now like this, I slide it up and then I can set the float deeper as well, putting the other way up so the float keeps coming up. Or if I, indeed if I want to shallow it, put my nail here and gently slide it. Sometimes a bit of spit helps that stop not slide. So you can adjust it perfectly to whatever depth you want to fish at, shallow, halfway, three quarters or near the bottom, whatever you want. But this, you can fish 15 feet deep even though the rods only say 9, 10 feet, because that stop knot goes through the rod rings, okay? If you put a split shot there to stop the flow, wrong, it jams in the tip ring. Okay, the other end is pretty basic. Couple of SSG weights there, and I normally, if I was twitching a, a dead bait, I'd be putting them right near the bait, but I don't want to do that. I want that to sit, if you like, vertically, and I want the live bait to be able to move around freely. I don't want to pin the live bait down deep with the, you know, the weight too near the bait, basically. All I'm doing for live baiting, and generally this is what I do, I don't like smothering them in treble hooks at all. One VB hook. A VB hook is a small, single holding hook and a bigger hook there, right? So I'm going to dip a bait out, but you see Mike do the lip hooking. If you're fishing somewhere deep, this is a totally awesome secret big game fishing tip when we use... Well, we use various, obviously, live baits for going deeper. If you want the bait to swim deep, don't hook it in the lip. That pulls it up. You just hook it behind the dorsal. Just gently nick it through the meat of the behind the dorsal. Now, if I let go of this, look at the way the angle that, that roach is laying. Oh, little rud. See? It's hanging down. It's hanging... It wants to pull down, and it will pull down if I put it in the water. That will ensure that it's going down deep. A little tip from big game fishermen, all the marlin fishermen and tuna fishermen out there go, oh, I know that, you always hook them behind the dorsal, it sends them deep. One of the 
the other problems you can get here is always keep in contact with live baits. If you put them in a buzzer, the buzzer's going off all the time because the fish is generally either slack lining you or going off to the side. And a little tip here is you can fish it and you can almost trot it all over the lake. You can go all over the lake, even rivers you can use them on, but different type of, uh, of, sort of what we call paternostral fixed ledges are good for, for live bait in there. But for a lake like this, it can cover a lot of distance. If you think it's in a weed, just draw it just to make it kick a little bit. It comes out the weed and it will start swimming again. So just keep your bail arm like this. Just, just open it. Keep your bail arm there. And if he wants to run, well, he's not going to run, is he? He's not going to run. But if he wants to move away, just slack off like that and just let him go where he wants to go. He's doing the work for you. The downside of it is he's going to want to get in every piece of weed and piece of snag because he knows where he's safe. He doesn't want to be tethered out in the open or near where those pike are. And if you get a pike one, sometimes the first thing you'll see is a highly active float going around all over the place before the pike grabs it. Now that one's gone static, he might have weed. So all I'm going to do is just wind down slowly and just draw it a foot or so. You'll feel the fish kick. There he is on the surface. And if I slack it back down again, there we go, the stop knot comes up against the float and we're all set. Well, as well as um, float fishing a live bait, it's always good to have a dead bait with you. This is half a sardine here. I'm just going to chuck that out in a, a little deep pool that we've got down here to my right. It's always worth having a dead bait out as well, just in case the pike aren't quite as switched on. They might be quite dormant and they might go for the smell as opposed to the sight. Guys, we've had disaster upon disaster this winter. Flooded rivers, storms, damaging winds. And now we've got, huh, remember I said about the batteries, I haven't used this live bait pump for a while. Buy new batteries. We have two live baits out, they've not been eaten, but we've thrown everything else that we have with us. Sardines, half sardines, whole sardines, twitch baits, spinners, sprats. And unfortunately, we've been told it's a live bait fishery, and without the batteries and the pump there, we have no live bait left. It's too late in the afternoon to catch any more. We're going to have to call it quits. We've really given it a hard shot here, but look out for this fishery. You're going to, there's going to be others turning up as well, I'm sure. It's one of those things. Give it a go. You can, but try. And only you guys out there know what fishing's like. Sometimes it's tough.